To check out all our products, go to musicnomadcare.com. Hey, it's Ram and the Music Nomad. This video is designed to show you how to set up your guitar using Music Nomad's Keep It Simple Setup Method. The KISS process uses our precision gauges and tools combined with step-by-step -step general guidelines anybody can follow and set up their guitar to play and sound great. To get the job done right, you will need our six-piece precision gauge set that includes a truss rod gauge and pick capo, string action gauge, radius gauge set, nut height gauge, and a 24-page instructional booklet. All of these uniquely designed to make the process much easier and precise than other gauges out there. The three Music Nomad tool sets are a 26-piece Guitar Tech screwdriver and wrench set, 11-piece truss rod wrench set, and a diamond-coated nut file set. With these four kits, you are able to set up most all guitar and basses out there. Before you get started on your setup, there are some pre-setup steps you should do. Remove all your strings with the Music Nomad grip cutter. With the strings now off, and with the Music Nomad radius gauge, Measure and make a note of the fretboard radius as you will need this info when you measure the string radius in the setup process. Tighten all screws, including the tuning machine bushings with Music Nomad's Guitar Tech tool set. Polish your frets with Music Nomad's Frying Fret Polish. Clean and condition the fretboard with Music Nomad's F1 oil. Clean the body and neck with Music Nomad cleaners. Finally, put new strings on with Music Nomad's Grip Winder. Okay, now you're ready to start the setup, featuring our talented guest guitar tech who will lead you through the process. Have fun. Hi, I'm Jeff Luttrell, owner of San Francisco Guitar Works and Sonoma County Guitar Works, and I am here to set up this beautiful 1963 Strat using the Music Nomad Keep It Simple Setup Method. My collaboration with Music Nomad has created a simple setup process to help you make your guitar play and sound great. Let's get started. So what is a setup? A setup is a process of adjustment that makes your guitar play and sound great and work well for you as the player. The key to the keep it simple setup process is the flow. And we're going to go over the flow for this guitar, which has an individually adjustable saddle bridge. Other guitars may have a fixed radius bridge and the flow is slightly different for those around the way you set up the bridge action height and radius. The first step will be setting our neck relief. So that is the amount of curvature in the neck from front to back. The next step will be setting the outer string action heights. That will be followed by setting the inner four string heights using a radius gauge and will match the radius of the bridge to the radius of the fretboard. After we set up our bridge, we will cut the nut slots correctly to allow for proper string height above the first fret. After that's completed, we'll set the intonation at the bridge, which will make the fretted notes play in tune with the open strings. And lastly, we will set our pickup heights for optimal sound and balance between the pickups. So we're going to start by setting our neck relief properly. The first step in that will be to measure our current neck relief. For that, I will need my Music Nomad pick capo and my truss rod gauge. So I'll take my pick capo and I will slide it over the E string, under the A string, and over the D, and then I'll slide it up to the first fret. Now what that does is it pushes the low E string down at the first fret, so I don't have to. Once I have my pick capo in place, I'm going to put my guitar in the playing position. An easy way to do it if you have a padded bench is just to set the waist of the guitar right on the corner of the bench. You don't have to hold it. Some folks hold the guitar up like this. I find it a little hard to work with, but this is a, a pretty good way. Once I have the guitar in the playing position and my pick capo in place, I'll take my truss rod gauge and I will find the correct gauge for this guitar. The truss rod gauge is a, a really cool tool. A lot of thought went into making this. Uh, you are provided with three different size gauges, three different thicknesses, six thousandths of an inch, eight thousandths of an inch, and ten thousandths of an inch to correspond to electric guitar, acoustic guitar and bass, and classical guitar respectively. These are clearly marked with what instrument they're used for. The instructions are printed right on the cover for your truss rod adjustment and the position of the gauge. They're not greasy like uh, feeler gauges you might pick up somewhere else and they are, uh, they're just really easy to use and easy to handle. 
So for this guitar, I'm going to select the six thousandths of an inch gauge, and that is marked with electric guitar. So I will take that gauge, and then once I have it, I will push my low E string down at the 12th fret. Since the capo is pressing down the string at the first fret, and I'm pushing down at the 12th fret, I've now created a straight edge between the first fret and the 12th fret, and I will measure my neck relief against that straight edge. Now I need my one critical tool, which is my glasses, so I can see what I'm doing here. Um, so I'll take my gauge, and I'm going to put it on top of the sixth fret, and I'm going to push it underneath the low E string. And what's happening on this guitar is the string is getting pushed up pretty severely by the gauge. So if we follow the touch rule, that is going to be a heavy touch. That's going to be not enough relief. The string is too close to the fret. What we're going to achieve on this guitar is the gauge going between the fret and the string and barely touching both of them. So the gauge is exactly the same thickness as the gap between the string and the fret. On this guitar, I will need to pull the neck off and access the truss rod nut at the heel. Sometimes you will see the pick guard has a lot of dings and burrs on it because people have tried to shortcut that and adjust the truss rod without pulling the neck off, but you really do just need to pull the neck and do it that way. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, loosen, my, loosen my strings. And sometimes if the, uh, if, if the neck screws are loose enough in the body, often you can just loosen the neck and tilt it back a little bit and access the truss rod without dinging up the pick guard. So we shall see on this guitar. So I'll get my number two Phillips bit to loosen my neck bolts. Stand the guitar up. So now I have the neck loose, and this one is pretty, uh, the screws are pretty loose in the body. So I'm actually able to loosen the neck screws, and by tilting the neck back, I can easily access the truss rod nut. So I don't have to take the neck all the way off. I'll grab my fender slotted screwdriver head from the truss rod tool kit. I will get that in here and I'll be able to easily access that truss rod. I'm going to go ahead and back that nut out about a quarter turn. And this is, uh, this is one of those situations where you just have to guess. So I will not know if I did it right until I string the guitar back up to pitch and remeasure. So I'll go ahead and bolt the neck back on. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is uh, being a vintage fender. Uh, this adjusts at the heel. Uh, many of the modern fenders, the American Standard, the Mexican Strats and Tellies, uh, those all have a headstock adjust, which could be either a 1 8 inch uh, if it's an American, or a 1 8 inch Allen wrench if it's an American Standard, or a 3 16 Allen wrench if it's a Mexican. On any truss rod, you will tighten the nut. You will turn clockwise to tighten the truss rod to take relief out of the neck you will loosen the truss rod by turning counterclockwise to put relief into the neck. On this neck, I turn counterclockwise to loosen the truss rod to introduce relief. If it was a headstock adjust, it's the same principle, but coming from this end, you would put the wrench into the nut and you would turn counterclockwise to loosen to allow more relief into the neck. You would turn clockwise to tighten to take relief out of the neck. Okay, so with my guitar back in tune, I will put my pick capo back in. Guitar back into the playing position, fret it at the 12th fret. Now I can clearly see that I have a gap between the 6th fret and the string. So I'll put my gauge in, and that is just a very light touch between the string and the fret. So this is a right at 6 thousandths of an inch neck relief. So I'll be able to move on now and work on my bridge. So now onto our bridge setup. We've set our truss rod and that will not be impacted by the adjustments we're gonna make on the bridge. So we're, we're good on the neck part. So we'll move on to our bridge. On an individually adjustable saddle bridge, the first thing we'll do is set our outer two strings to the action height that we want. 
To measure our outer string action, we'll use our string action gauge. And this, uh, the Music Nomad gauge that we have developed is, I think, far superior to any gauge that's out there. Uh, one big advantage that this gauge has over others is just the ease of readability. It has a white etched markings on a black background, so it has a lot of contrast. It really pops. Um, the more common silver gauges uh, have a tendency, the contrast between the black markings and the silver gauge is not as great. And if you have shadows or you have a little parallax, depending on the angle that you're looking at, it just can be really hard to read. So I'm really happy to use this because I can actually see it. Um, it also has uh, markings for uh, millimeters, uh, 64 and thousandths of an inch. So you can measure your action height uh, those three ways. A lot of people, you know, people do them all different ways. So we have all three of the markings on there. Uh, there's a ruler on either end, one side millimeters, one side in inches. And then there's a chart on uh, each side that shows the most common measurements, action measurements for acoustic guitar, electric guitar, and bass. And those are in uh, thousandths of an inch and also in millimeters. So it's very easy to pick up the gauge and look and see, okay, I have an electric guitar, so I'm gonna look here for my action uh, in inches. So I look at the electric column and I've got my action low E, high E, and the most common measurement for this is going to be a low medium action. And that's going to be 60 thousandths of an inch of action on the bass side and 50 thousandths on the treble side. Now, we didn't come up with those numbers just out of thin air. Um, having done literally thousands, probably tens of thousands of setups at this point through uh, both of my shops, we just know that those action specs work really well for 90% of the players. I mean, I contend that if you every guitar in the world was set up with those action specs, most players would be completely fine with it and everybody would be happy. So they work really well across a, lot, a wide range of playing styles and a, a wide range of player uh, technique. So we're gonna use the low medium spec on this guitar. So we'll do 60 thousandths on the bass side and 50 thousandths on the treble. So I will use my pick capo to hold down my low E string at the first fret. And then I will put the guitar in the playing position. Having found the inches rule, I will go ahead and put my string action gauge behind the low E string at the 12th fret. So what I'm looking for is what line on the gauge meets the bottom of the string. An easy way to start this is you can take your <clears throat> 20 thousandths line and put that right on the 12th fret. And that should be well below the bottom of your string, unless your action is just incredibly low, but that should be e very easy to read. Then you can move your gauge to the left and you will see the lines getting closer and closer to the string as the gauge moves across the 12th fret. So now on this guitar, I'm finding that my low E string is sitting right on top of the 70 line. So this guitar has an action of 70 thousandths of an inch on the bass side. So I'm gonna to wanna to lower that down to 60 thousandths of an inch. So in order to do that, <clears throat> I will get my the Allen wrench that fits the saddle screws on these saddles. Now, an American uh, fender is going to have a 50 thousandths of an inch Allen wrench to fit these saddle screws. So I'll find my 50 thousandths Allen wrench here in my tool kit, and I can lower my saddle by loosening the screws. I'm gonna turn them to the left, and those are gonna back the screws out of the saddle, which is gonna allow the saddle to lower towards the bridge. So I'm gonna back out the one screw, then back out the other. I always wanna be sure that whenever I'm finished adjusting the saddle, the saddle bottom is parallel to the bridge plate. You don't want it uh, tilted one way or the other. You wanna have direct string pressure on both saddle screws. So now that I've done that, I will make sure, tune back to pitch, <clears throat> and remeasure. Okay, so that is exactly at the top of the 60 line. So I now know that I have 60 thousandths of an inch action on the bass side. So now I will move to the treble string <clears throat> and do exactly the same thing. Put my pick capo at the first fret, holding down the high E at the first fret, then I will put my gauge behind the high E. 
<clears throat> and this is sitting at 70 thousandths on the treble side, just like it was on the bass side. So I'm going to go ahead and lower that down by loosening the saddle screws. Until I have 50. So that is sitting exactly on top of the 50 line. So I have 50 thousandths of an inch action on my treble side, which corresponds to the low medium setting for electric guitars, which is the most common. <clears throat> so now I'll tune back to pitch. And I can set my inner four strings now using my radius gauge. Now I've measured this neck and very common for a vintage Fender, it is a seven and a quarter radius. And uh, the radius gauges that uh, I helped design with Music Nomad, I think are really the best ones out right now. They have a, a black finish, which I, is very easy to read. The contrast between the black surface and the string is a lot better to my eye than the uh, silver, which can kind of blend in with the strings. Uh, it also has on it, etched on it, it has the uh, some instructions. Just helpful reminders that your string radius is going to equal your fretboard radius. So this arc of your strings will equal the arc of your frets. And it has, shows where to place the gauge just about a quarter of an inch in front of the saddles. And that, um, and in order to measure your fretboard radius, the instruction is there that you would have your strings off and you would measure at the last fret. So they're just really easy to use, uh, very easy to read and have some helpful instructions if uh, like me, you have trouble remembering everything. So with my radius gauge, I like to pick the guitar up so I can look down the strings and I will take my radius gauge and place it on the strings. Now this is rocking pretty severely in the center. So I know that my string arc is rounder than the radius that I want it to be. So I'm gonna to need to lower these inner four strings in order to make a perfect seven and a quarter radius. I find that it's easier to, if you, if you find that your guitar is in the same condition with the inner four strings higher than the outer two, I find that it's easier to just lower all four of the saddles down below the gauge and then bring them up one at a time to meet the gauge rather than trying to bring them down one at a time to achieve that seven and a quarter. So what I'm gonna do is just lower, I'm gonna lower the inner four saddles down below where I think they're gonna to need to be. And then I'll just bring them up one at a time to make that seven and a quarter radius. So by doing this, what we've done is we've set our outer string action to be a nice comfortable height. And now we are setting our inner four strings to be an even height above the fretboard to match the heights from the low E to the high E. And what that's going to do is give you a very even playability across the fretboard. So now that I've lowered those saddles down, they are all below, well the A is right on the money, but the D, the G, and the B are all below the gauge. So whenever you place your gauge on your strings in front of your saddle. Sometimes, you know, even with the best gauges and good lighting, it can be hard to see these small gaps. I mean, most of us in our daily life are not looking for gaps of a thousandth of an inch. So uh, if you have a little trouble kind of zeroing in on this, you know, be patient with yourself because uh, you'll definitely get it. Um, an easy trick is uh, resting the gauge lightly on the strings and then you can pluck the strings and listen for what strings vibrate against the gauge and what strings do not. So by doing that, I can hear my E hits, my A hits, my D does not, my G does, my B does not, and my E does. So I'm gonna need to raise my D and my B in order to touch the gauge. So I'm gonna bring up my D string, just a hair, my B string, just a hair, and then looking down it, I can see that they are touching, but by ringing them against the gauge, I can also hear that they are all touching the gauge. So I now have my proper seven and a quarter inch radius. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and string, uh, tune the guitar back to pitch. It always goes out of pitch whenever you adjust your radius, you've moved the saddles up and down. So you wanna get that back to pitch. So now we've set our neck relief using the truss rod gauge and our truss rod adjustment tool. We've set our outer two 
E saddles using our string action gauge and our 50 thousandths of an inch Allen wrench out of our tool kit. We've set our inner four strings height using our radius gauge and again our 50 thousandths of an inch wrench. And now we're going to move down to the nut and we're going to cut the nut slots correctly. The nut is a very critical component in a guitar. I mean, it, it can make or break the way a guitar plays, how well it stays in tune, uh, you know, the way the, the intonation is at the first position. So for just being a very simple piece of plastic or bone, it really has a big impact on the overall playability and sound of the guitar. So it's critical that the nut is cut correctly. A nut is cut correctly if the action at the first fret is comfortable, the intonation is correct, and there's no open string buzz. There's a little bit of a height window that you can be inside and meet all of those requirements. We designed the uh, nut height gauge to give you a safe starting point for your string height at the first fret. That's going to allow your string to vibrate cleanly and not buzz at the first fret. It's going to play with a good comfortable action and the intonation will be correct. Uh, if you have a very light attack, you could cut the nut a little bit lower and we have provided gauges that are thicker and thinner if you do want to go a, a, a little higher on your nut height or a little lower on your nut height. Uh, this gauge is really uh, cool. It's a lot like the truss rod gauge um, in that it has a, a clear designations on the gauges themselves as to where they're to be used. Uh, we have our 16, 18, and 20 thousandths thick gauges are the most commonly used sizes. So the 20 thousandths of an inch gauge is marked clearly with low E and A string on guitar, E and A string on a bass, and the low E and then the G string on a classical. And they move across to the 18 and 16 and they're marked with their respect respective strings. The uh, additional gauges provided, the 14 thousandths and 12 thousandths, they're not, and the 22 thousandths, they're not marked, but they're there in case you want to experiment with a little higher or a little lower action at the nut. So what we'll do to start is we will begin with our low E and A string gauge, which is 20 thousandths of an inch thick. And I'll take my guitar, put it in the playing position. We won't need to fret the string or do anything to that. We'll just leave the string open and I'll take my gauge and I will slide it on top of the fret and underneath the string. And this has a little bit of a gap between the string and the gauge. So using the touch rule, you have either a heavy touch, which would be the gauge is, is pushing the string up. The string is heavily contacting the gauge. You would have a light touch which is where the string is barely contacting the gauge, or you would have no touch, which is what I have. On the back of the gauge, you have printed uh, the touch rule for the nut slots. You have either yes or no touch. This guitar has no touch. The string is not touching the gauge when the gauge is on top of the fret. So I will file the nut slot lower. Um, if you're having trouble telling if it's touching or not, you can put the gauge under and you can give it a little tap and I can hear that there's a little gap there. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get my correct nut file and I'm gonna file that nut slot. So when you're assembling a set of nut files to cut a nut, uh, you will want to know your string gauges. So if you don't know them, uh, you can either look up your strings online and you can figure out exactly what the individual gauges are, or if you've just put your strings on, uh, just grab your string pack and it will designate uh, the exact diameters of the strings for each position on the guitar. So this guitar happens to have, like many electric guitars, a set of tens on it. So it's from 10 thousandths of an inch to 46 thousandths. So I'm gonna assemble a set of nut files to work with these strings. Now you might be wondering what file do I use with a 46 string? Well, you would want to use a file that's 46 thousandths up to 49 thousandths. You can go about three thousandths of an inch bigger than the string diameter. Uh, if you start going much larger than that, the string slot starts getting too big and the string can vibrate in the bottom of the slot. If you go smaller than that, the string will pinch and hang up in the nut slot and you'll have tuning issues. So you're going to want to go with the same size file as your string up to three thousandths of an inch larger.
So now I've assembled my, my set of nut files from a, a 10 thou up to a 46 thou to cover my 10 to 46 set. Um, nut files have been a challenge for a long time. Uh, whenever I have students take my setup class, many of them find uh, buying tools to be a big barrier to entry as far as setting up their own instruments. Nut files are usually the big hang up because they are a hundred and something dollars for a set of uh, six files that they may only use, you know, five or 10 times. So it's been really a, a challenge to get people working on their own stuff because of the barrier to entry to tools. The files that I help design with Music Nomad are a real game changer as far as nut files go. Uh, most nut files are cut with standard file teeth. They have a, a crosshatch pattern uh, or they just have a, an angled tooth pattern. Um, I won't even talk about the ones that are sold online that are really just uh, oxyacetylene torch cleaners that are completely useless. Um, but what we've done is have made a, a diamond coated uh, file that is exactly the same diameter as the string. And what's really cool about that, uh, or one of the many things that's really cool about that, is the, the diamond file leaves a very uniform finish on the bottom of the nut slot. So you don't have to go back in and polish the slot or worry about any uh, chatter marks in the slot. Um, if you make your own nuts uh, from scratch, you may have experienced the tendency of the standard nut files to skate as you're trying to establish that nut slot. These files cut in much straighter. They don't have that tendency to drift as you're establishing that nut slot so you can keep your nut spacing or your string spacing at the nut much more uniform. Um, they, uh, you can use them one of two ways. You can either use them with the handle, um, which I like to do if I have a nut that is uh, already has established nut slots. Um, it's just a really nice little ergonomic handle. It's really easy to control. Uh, sometimes if I'm cutting a uh, a nut for the first time, or if I have a, a saddle slot where it's a little tough to see, I'll just use the file out of the handle so I can get a really good look at exactly what the uh, the cutting surface is doing. So um, these things are great. I mean, they cut they cut metal no problem. They'll cut through bone just with no issues at all. And I mean, they I've been cutting nuts for. 20 years. I started out with the, the three the three file Ibanez set that's super cheap. And then I've had every every other file that you can possibly buy from Grobe to all of the tool suppliers, all the stuff. And these are by far the best files that I have used. So I am pretty stoked. If this was the only set that there was and I got to have them, that would be good enough. But these are really great and everybody should get them. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my low E string and I have um, a bit of a gap that I measured um, with my nut height gauge. So uh, whenever you're filing a nut slot, you want to file at a slight downward angle towards the headstock because you want the string to leave the front of the nut crisply. You don't want to have a, a rounded over slot or have a flat slot that the string could buzz on. Um, one tip I will give you, if you haven't cut a nut before and you're a little unsure of your ability to hold an angle, if you cut too steeply on a fender, you can cut string slots into the wood behind the nut. I see that a lot on a lot of fenders, bases and things. So what you can do is you can put a piece of painter's tape across the headstock behind the nut like so. And that isn't going to keep you from cutting into the wood, but it will at least give you some warning that if you're cutting at too steep of an angle, you're going to want to drop that file down and lessen that angle um, before you damage the back of your headstock. So I'm going to go ahead and just leave that on there. Um, I will take my string and uh, detune it. So now I'll go ahead and pull the string out of the nut slot. And um, I'll just use this one, just the file, just to show you. It's, it's pretty easy to manipulate these if you need to use them without the handle. And I'll go ahead and put this in the slot. And now I'm cutting at a downward angle of maybe two degrees. It's just a very, very slight downward angle towards the tuner, towards the headstock. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and just give this about five light strokes. So then I'll put my string back in the slot. Tune back to pitch. And now I will take my gauge. I still have just a little bit of a gap. So I'm gonna do that again quickly. And 
Now you definitely, when you're cutting a nut slot, you know, you want to see a little bit of dust. If you're sitting there with it just barely in and you're barely moving it, I mean, it's going to take all day. So you want to be creating a little bit of dust that shows you're actually removing some material. So now I'll remeasure. And that is just perfect. It's just barely, barely moving that string. So it's a very light touch between the string, the gauge, and the fret. So once you've cut your nut slot to the correct height, you can just give the string a pluck and just make sure it doesn't buzz. At the uh, recommended heights, it shouldn't, um, but you wanna give it a quick, uh, quick strum and make sure that it's uh, playing cleanly, and then you'll know that it, you're good to move on to the next string. So now I'll use my same gauge, the 20 thousandths gauge, and I'm going to put that below the E string and I'm going to put it under the A string. And it is very slightly moving that string. So I know that I do not need to do any cutting on that. And I'll just want to check it and make sure that it doesn't buzz. So this string plays cleanly at that height. It's a little below spec, but if it were to buzz, you can either shim, have your nut shimmed, or you can have a new nut made. And you'd wanna go down and uh, check with your local guitar shop about those paths. So now we'll move on from the E and the A to the D string. So I'm gonna switch gauges at this point to the uh, 18 thousandths of an inch gauge, and it's marked D and G guitar. So for the D string, I'm gonna go ahead and put that in under the A and the E, and I'll need to lift the A and the E up a little bit so I can get a good tight fit uh, between the gauge and the fret right there at the D string. And so I've got just a tiny, tiny gap between the uh, string and the gauge. So I'm gonna go ahead and file that down just a bit. Um, now another uh, cool thing about the files is that they have this, uh, this end guard, so it will definitely lessen uh, any tendency to damage a headstock, it, instead of having a sharp metal corner at the end of your file, you've got this little bumper. I mean, if you, you know, so you definitely still want to be careful and cautious, but it will save you if you aren't paying attention or you have a little slip. Um, it should, you know, keep your headstock much better protected. And on this, you can just lift the, uh, you can just lift the string out of the nut slot. You don't have to detune it. Uh, there's very little downward tension. If it had an extra string tree, you might want to pop the string out from under the tree, but you can just move it out of the way. So now I'm going to use the, uh, the file that's in the handle. It's very easy to, uh, very easy to control. And I'll put that down in the slot. Get the little slot's a little tight. Took a second to open it up. Go. I'll give it another measurement. Yeah, that's good. It is just barely, barely moving that string out of the way. So make sure we're in tune. Now that I've got the string cut to spec, I can give it a pluck, make sure that it plays cleanly, and then I can move on to the G. So at this point, I'll come in from the underside and I'm gonna lift, lift that E and B out of the way, and then I can see that that G is a little high. So I'm gonna to wanna to go ahead and get my correct size file for my G string, pull it out of the way, and then I'll just give that, it's very, very close. So I'm just gonna give it a very light, And a measure. And that is right on the money. So now that the G nut slot is cut correctly, I'm gonna move on to the B and the E. So I'm gonna switch my gauges and bump down to the 16 thousandths of an inch gauge, which is marked high uh, B and high E guitar. So I'll slide that in under the E string. My B looks just right on the money. And it's definitely, I can tell it's my E, my high E is definitely a little bit low. Um, so I'm gonna just uh, check those strings for any buzz. And that doesn't have any, it's really clean. If you have nut slots that are low and you just wanna do some academic research, you can definitely use the thinner gauges to just measure where they are. 
and you can start getting an idea about uh, nut heights that work for you that may be outside of the uh, most commonly used range. So now that we're done with cutting the nut, we will not need our nut files anymore. So I'll go ahead and clear my bench. It's always a good idea to maintain a clear bench, clear workspace, so you don't scratch a guitar, um, you don't move it across a tool or anything like that, and it just helps you be efficient in your workflow. So now that we've got our truss rod set correctly, we've set our bridge action height and radius, we've cut our nut slots correctly, we're going to go ahead and do our bridge intonation. As I'm checking my intonation on the upper frets, I'm noticing a condition that is somewhat common in strats. It's called stratitis. The pickups are too close to the strings and they are imparting a magnetic pull on the string that is causing the note to have a warbly sound. It is not ringing clearly and it affects the intonation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lower these pickups down uh, until the string is outside of that uh, magnetic force and that will allow the string to ring clearly. Then we'll go ahead uh, and readjust them correctly after we're done with the setup process. So I'm gonna drop these pickups down until they're just about at the height of the uh, pick guard. Um, so now that I have my pickups lowered down, I will go ahead and move back into my intonation. So we've still got our, our tuning right on the money. And we may find that the intonation is different now. See, now the intonation is just about perfect. So that's a good example of the impact that magnets can have on the strings oscillation. If the pickups are too close to the strings, particularly on a strap, it will cause the string to oscillate in an uneven manner and it will cause the intonation to drift. So if you, um, you know, if you want, you just want to make sure that your pickups are low enough that they're not pulling on those strings. Okay, now we'll move on over to our A string. Okay, got that right in tune. Just looking real good there. It's looking great. It was a tiny bit flat on the 12th, tiny bit sharp on the 17th, but you know, that's, they're both so close. They're gonna be right on the money. We go on our D. D's a little sharp at the 12th, a little sharp at the 17th. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull that D saddle back just a little bit. Um, I'm gonna loosen my string to uh, decrease the tension on that saddle. And then I'm going to grab my, uh, my number one Phillips head and I'm going to tighten the saddle screw and pull that saddle back. So back to pitch. Right on the money. Perfect. Perfect. So perfect 12th fret, 17th fret. I'm gonna move on to the G. When you're intonating, you wanna be sure to press with the same type of pressure that you would use when you're normally playing. Since I'm usually setting up guitars that are not my own, I've developed sort of a feel for doing it that seems to work for my clients, but you'll just wanna press the string down just like you are playing because that's gonna be the uh, amount of pressure that you'll place on the string just during your normal play. So the G is looking really good. Let's move over to our B string. It's a little sharp up at the 17th. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that back just a hair. Just because they might be, uh, you know, have more of a tendency to play up high on the B string than they would on the E or the A. So I wanna make sure that we Get that nice and close. Perfect. And perfect. So lastly, the high E. That is drifting ever so slightly flat. The high 17th is a little flat. I'm gonna back that screw out just a little bit, sharpen that up just a bit. So 
That looks really good. That looks really good. Couldn't, couldn't be in any more intonated than that. So for pickup adjustment heights on a Stratocaster, a good starting point is 330 seconds away from the string on the bass side and a 16th of an inch away from the string on the treble side. And you can set all pickups to that height. Um, I often find that uh, at that height, I like to drop the neck down just a bit, but we'll see how this one comes out. They, they all sound a little bit different. So I will push down my string at the, at the last fret on the low E string, and I'm going to measure using my inches gauge on the corner here for my pickup heights. And I'm gonna measure for 330 seconds. And this is just about right exactly at 330 seconds on the bass side. And I'm going to measure for 16th. It's much too close on the treble side. So I'm gonna drop that down by loosening the screw, which allows the pickup to move down in the, in the uh, pick guard. Still a little too high. Okay, that's right. Let's try my middle pickup. It's a little too high on the base side. And let's check my treble. I can see that that is too close. So you might have noticed I pushed down on the pickup. Um, the way that these pickups are secured to the pick guard, they have a screw that goes through the pick guard, and then there's a piece of surgical tubing or a spring that pushes the pickup down against, uh, pushes it down away from the pick guard. So if the surgical tubing gets a little bit compressed or the spring doesn't quite have enough tension, maybe the pick guard is shrunk and is pushing on the pickup cover a little bit, the pickup might not move by the spring pressure alone. So if you start backing your screw out to lower the pickup and the screw is backing out of the pick guard and the pickup's not moving, just push the pickup down and it'll snap it back down. Uh, you may find though that the, on a Strat, particularly uh, Telecasters sometimes use them too and it's a problem on them as well, is the surgical tubing uh, just degrades over time and it loses its ability to push the pickup down. So what will happen is you'll lower your pickup down and then it'll be loose and it will rattle. So at that point you have to take off the pick guard and either get new surgical tubing to uh, take up that gap or you can just ditch the surgical tubing and use springs, um, which either, either way is totally fine. Um, but you'll, you'll sometimes will notice that if a strap pickup seems loose, you can pick it up and push it down. That means the surgical tubing has degraded and is no longer uh, taking up that space. Lastly, on my neck pickup, that looks good on the base side. And right at the 16th on the treble side. So now that we've adjusted all three pickups, uh, the pickup balance is very even between the pickups. This guitar has a three position switch which operates each pickup individually. That's very standard vintage Fender. A more modern Fender would have a five position. Uh, so you would have your bridge position, which is your bridge pickup only. Then you would have a second position, which is bridge and middle. Your third position would be middle. Your fourth position would be neck and middle, and your fifth position would be neck. So uh, whether you have a three position or a five position, the adjustment process would be the same. You wanna to try to get your individual pickups balanced with one another. When I'm setting up a Strat that has a five position switch, I don't really pay a lot of attention to positions two and four. I try to get the individual pickups uh, working well with each other, and then usually the in-between positions just take care of themselves. For detailed videos on how to use each gauge during the setup process, please visit musicnomadcare.com for all our how-to videos.